names in summer intern uh, participants. Uh, it's, it's great to have you here today. My name is Dan Culhane. I'm the president and CEO of the Ames Chamber of Commerce. And this program is one of the most important things we do on an annualized basis. And that's supporting the internships that occur in our community here in Ames and Story County. And today, we're really fortunate to have a, a very special guest that to kick us off this year, to provide a little inspiration uh, as, we, as we look through the through the, the course of the summer, and uh, you uh, you are um, working through your internship experiences. Um, of course, if, in this business, most of these things don't happen without a wide variety of sponsors. And uh, Gary's going to turn to our list of sponsors, I believe. And you'll see a, a wide variety of Ames and Story County businesses there. And hopefully, most of you who are on this call today as interns are represented in a lot of these terrific companies and organizations that help underwrite the cost of such programming. And so with that, I, I, I express my special gratitude to all of our sponsors, and we'll get started uh, with our presentation from Jamie Pollard with a brief uh, bio that um, I have in front of me. Uh, Jamie uh, encouraged me not to read all this, and so I'll, I'll try to respect his wishes. But uh, folks, if, if you, if you haven't, had, haven't had the chance to hear Jamie before, I know you'll be inspired today, and he's got a long list of accomplishments that I have to touch on a few of those before he gets underway. Uh, Mr. Pollard's in his 15th year as Director of Athletics at Iowa State University, and uh, I've been around Iowa State Athletics for a long time, and the impact has been immense. Uh, more than $250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars has been invested in facilities. He's tripled the operating budget of the, of the athletics department, and I think the, one of the most unique things is he's eliminated the, the, the uh, dependence upon state funding uh, for the athletics department, which is critically important. He was named the 2019 Under Armour Athletics Director of the Year by the National Athletics Director Association. He's a member of the NCAA Men's Basketball Selection Committee. He's an executive committee member of the National Athletic Directors Association and has served previously as their president of the Division 1A Athletics Director Association and the Collegiate Athletics Business Managers Association. He's also a former national champion, uh, long distance runner at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, where he's also a member of their Hall of Fame. Uh, upon uh, completing his studies at UW Oshkosh, he spent time in a variety of leadership roles at uh, the University of St. Louis, uh, Maryland University, and the University of Wisconsin. Jamie and his wife Ellen have four children, Thomas, Annie, Maggie, and James. And uh, we are thrilled he's given us a few minutes this afternoon to, to share with all of you. So Jamie, take it away. And thank you, my friend, for being here today. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say to this uh, great group of interns that we have together that uh, Dan came into office at roughly the same time I did. So much of what's taken place, um, not only in Iowa State Athletics, has taken place in Ames. So Dan and I have parallel career tracks and parallel success. So Dan, an honor to be here with you today. Um, but there's many a time that Dan does this for us uh, in athletics um, as a former letter winner and uh, has been president of the Letter Winners Association in our uh, organization. Dan has been a great cyclone. So Dan, thanks for having me. Um, you know, um, although I'm 55 years old, it feels like just yesterday, I was an intern just like you all are right now um, in Appleton, Wisconsin. And uh, I'm gonna put this on for a second and then I'll take it off. But, you know, I got my little bean counter hat because um, I'm, a, I think, walking proof that anybody can become just about anything they wanna become. Even somebody that was an accounting major at little old Wisconsin Oshkosh that can become the athletics director at Iowa State University. So, um, put that aside for a little bit, but there's not many of us that are CPAs that rise up to be athletics directors. But um, I, I always like to give that as a backdrop because oftentimes I get asked by young people that are just starting out, um, at least in my field, they'll wanna come over and talk to me about, well, you know, I wanna be an athletics director, how do I do that? And I always give the same advice, which is there's no magic pill um, to becoming you know, uh, an athletics director, just like there's no magic pill to becoming the president of any organization. You know, it, it takes um, a lot of passion. It takes a lot of hard work. But what it really takes is at a young age, 
figuring out what you're good at and figuring out what you have a lot of passion for. And if you can put those two together, you'll rise up through whatever organization you're in, into great management, and then ultimately into great leadership um, opportunities. And um, that's why I started with the Green Visor, because uh, I was blessed as being somebody that was very analytical, that liked dealing with numbers, and I was an accountant. And, you know, so you get good at something that you hopefully have a little passion for, and where does it take you? Well, in my case, it took me through a lot of management, a lot of leadership through organizations to ultimately be in the athletics director. So um, I, I like sharing that because I'm a firm believer in you got to start someplace. So every one of you is starting as an intern in the great city of Ames, and we want to be able to incubate that, hopefully into someday you're leading a great organization, hopefully in Ames, because um, that's the goal here. But, um, but ultimately, we want you to fulfill whatever you got great passion for and whatever you're good at. Um, I'm going to begin with the end in mind and give a little story here, and then that'll speak a little bit into um, some of the things I want to talk about, which is culture, communication, and ultimately my version of leadership. But um, that story goes with what has gone down here with um, the COVID-19 um, challenges. And one of the things that we did in our organization real early on um, in terms of everybody in the department agreeing to give up 10% of their salary for a year. And, and not why we did it, but more the issue of how we did it. Um, you know, when we did that and we essentially did it overnight, many, many peers around the country, many lawyers around the country reached out to the general counsel, reached out to President Winterstein to ask, how did you do that? How did you get the football coach to give up 10% of his salary? I mean, close to a million dollars in total compensation. Um, how did you get him to give that up so quickly overnight? And we kind of joked internally and said the answer, um, you know, because most people thought it was something in a contract or something that, you know, was maybe we had finagled, like, you know, he was going to get it back later. Um, and the real answer was we had – created a great culture at Iowa State, but that culture started 15 years ago. It's not something you just get to decide overnight that you're going to have a culture where everybody in your department comes together and gives up $5 million worth of compensation to help your organization go forward. And so I want to kind of peel back the onion a little bit today um, and share some topics with you. And then hopefully there'll be some questions that you all have that we can dive a little bit deeper. Um, but I, I always like to say um, the culture that we formed here at Iowa State, how, how did we do that? And, you know, when I think of my organization and I think about how we compare to the Texases and the Oklahomas of the world, um, you know, there's departments we compete against that have far greater budgets, that have far bigger and better facilities, um, maybe live in warmer climates, maybe in perceived better places to live. Um, and people wonder, well, how do, you, how do you do that at Iowa State when you're up against that? And what I always say is this. I always say, yes, you got to have a good budget. Yes, you got to have nice facilities. But in the end, if we think we're going to have a bigger budget or outspend somebody or outbuild somebody, then um, you know, we're probably going to be very disappointed. Because the key to the success in an organization like Iowa State in Ames, Iowa, isn't about your budget. It isn't about your facilities. It's 100% about your people and having the best possible people for your organization. And so we always talk about our people being our secret sauce. That's the difference maker at Iowa State. The margins aren't going to be in our facilities. And Dan referenced, you know, we've spent $250 million in facilities and they're working hard today. And hopefully you won't hear some loud bang in here during this next 30 to 45 minutes. Um, yes, you know, we do need to work on our facilities and we need to raise money and do things. But in the end, our margin is not going to be because we have better facilities. Oklahoma or Texas will just build another one. They'll print more money from their gas and oil uh, monies. Um, we've got to be solely focused on having um, our margins being our people. And so when anybody starts in our athletics department, whether you're an intern, a, you know, a student worker, 
any, any form, graduate assistant, head football coach, um, you're going to meet with the athletics director right off the bat. And you're going to get 30 minutes with me where it gives me an opportunity to learn more about who's in our department, learn more what I call off resume. Um, but what I share with every single person in our department is some foundational um, elements that I think are key to our success that I think you can kind of take with you as you think about your career. And number one is this. I just flat out start with this, and most people look at me cross-eyed when I say it, when I say, we don't have the best people in our department. We absolutely don't have the best people. And, and why do I say that? Okay, well, there's a lot of really good people in this world, and I think it'd be very disingenuous for the leader to say, we've got the best people. That, you know, all the greatest people in the world choose to work at Ames, Iowa, at Iowa State University. That'd be a flat-out lie, okay? There's really good people working all over this country, all over this world. Um, but I know this. We work really, really hard to get the right people in our organization. And if we get the right people in our organization, then we've got the best people for Iowa State University. And why that's important is, you know, we can have a head coach. You know, if, if Matt Campbell left today, the Des Moines Register will, will tweet tonight, write tomorrow, you know, here are the 10 candidates Pollard needs to be looking at. And usually anybody on this call that follows athletics could probably pick those 10 people. That's how little those sports writers really spend time trying to figure out, do we have the right person? Because most people just go look and go, well, that person wins at that organization. Nick Saban's a great coach at Alabama, so he would probably be a great coach at Iowa State. And what I'd contest is just because you're really good somewhere else doesn't make you a guarantee to be good at another organization. It takes finding the right people for your organization. And that's the art of leadership. And what that really comes down to is figuring out what is right for your organization. You know, and when I first started 15 years ago, I didn't understand that. You know, I did not understand that. I just thought, I'm the accountant, I'm analytical, we'll just look at the numbers and we can figure out who the best person is. And what it took was time to learn, time to make some mistakes, time to kind of fall down and have to brush off the dirt off your knees and pick yourself back up to figure out what makes somebody the right person for our organization. And so when I kind of peel that onion back and think about what makes somebody the right person for a place like Iowa State, there's a couple of things that stand out. First and foremost is they've got to be somebody that when they arrive here, that they still have that little chip on their shoulder about wanting to prove something. If they arrive here thinking they already, you know, they've arrived, they're in the Big 12, they're big time, they're fatal and they don't even know it. Because what's going to happen to that person, they're going to quickly find out that their counterpart, their peer, who they're competing against, at Texas or Oklahoma has better facilities and a bigger budget. And so what we need to do is find those people that say, I want to be at the place that maybe doesn't have everything, that wants to rely upon people, and then I'm going to show you how I can achieve something at that place. Because I get turned on by a bigger challenge. And so when I think about when we hired Matt Campbell, the last question I asked Coach Campbell before the, he, before the interview was going to end, but it turned into before he accepted the job, since he accepted it on the spot, um, was I asked him this. He was at a point in time in his career, head coach at Toledo, where he was going to take that next step. He was going to go be a head coach somewhere else. And he had a lot of other places that were uh, flirting with him, that were trying to lure him to come be their head coach. And so I flat out asked him, I said, Matt, your next head coaching job, is it going to be a transaction or is it a calling? Because if it's a transaction, then go to wherever it was, Missouri, Arkansas, go wherever, because the transaction will probably be easier and the transaction will actually be bigger. They'll pay you more money, and it will probably be easier to be successful than if you come to Iowa State. But if you come to Iowa State, you know, 
You're going to come to a place where being the head coach is a calling. You're going to come to a place where if you bring home the championship trophy, we're not going to say put it over there with the other six. We're going to say, what do we do with this trophy? we got to go build a trophy case. If you come to Iowa State, using an analogy, if you come to Iowa State, you're going to come to a place where you're going to start to climb a mountain. And when you go up that mountain, you're going to quickly learn that there's no trails, there's no maps, there's no signage, there's no footprints, there's no flags. Because nobody has been up that mountain as far as you're going to go. You're going to be the first person to go that high on the mountain. And if that excites you, if that's a calling to what motivates you, then come to a place like Iowa State. Because if you have success, they'll build a statue of you. You'll be the talk of the town. You won't be at a place where they say, oh, it's about time you did that. Because, you know, we did that in 1980. We did that in 1990. We did that in 2000. They'll say, thank you for helping us do something you've never, we've never been able to do or we never thought we could do. And so having people in your department that are excited and challenged by being told you can't do that and your response is, step aside and watch me do it. Um, that's number one. Number two is having people that either don't have or know how to pack their ego. At a place like Iowa State, ego is a stunt. It just stunts growth. It kills culture. Um, because at a place like Iowa State, you need everybody coming together to help you. As great as Fred Hoiberg was, Fred Hoiberg couldn't do it all at Iowa State. You need everybody pulling for you. You need the chamber and the businesses in this community pulling for you. You need the people in housing, financial aid, in event management, in compliance, in you know, food and beverage. You need everybody pulling for you. And typically, if it's all about you and it's all about your ego, those people quickly start shutting down on you. And then you don't get that whole team atmosphere of the people that you need to help you go up the mountain. Um, and so at the crux of it is coming back to hiring people that you believe fit this organization the absolute best. And when I look around at a lot of our leaders and our coaches, you can see people that fit the culture of Ames, Iowa. Matt Campbell, Steve Prohm, um, Christy Johnson Lynch, um, you know, you go down the coaches that have had success here and you find people that are just great people that you love to be around. And I contrast that to some of the people that I see around the country and we, we joke and say that person could never survive at Iowa State because the fans, the constituents, the people that pay your salary, that donate, that buy the tickets, they're looking for somebody to lead in this department that's more like them and not somebody that's not like them. And so then that, that takes me to the second point of leadership. You know, Dan asked me to make some comments on leadership. And um, I've over the years watched my belief of understanding a leadership evolve. And I think back to 15 years ago when I was hired, you get asked, can you come out and talk about leadership? And I have to tell you, my first couple times I did it, I didn't know what to say. I totally kind of made it up on the fly because I thought to myself, what do I know about leadership? All of a sudden, I was thrust into this position that everybody just assumed, well, now you're a leader, so you must have all the answers. And I've watched my definition of leadership evolve over time because I believe leadership is something that you're partially born with. It's a chip that makes you want to be on the point and be a leader. But at the same time, the greatest leaders are the ones that know it's a work in progress and you continually have to polish that leadership chip. And what I've come to learn over time is I don't call it leadership anymore. I actually call it followship. And I always kind of chuckle and say, if you really want to know about leadership, you shouldn't invite the leader. So sorry, Dan, you shouldn't have invited me to talk about leadership. You should have invited some of our employees. Because if you really want to know what makes a great leader, don't ask the leader, 
The leader's going to tell you what they think, which is a little self-serving. You ought to really ask the employees because the employees will be the ones that will tell you, why am I following that person? And that's what made me start thinking about the real essence of leadership should be called followship because what's one thing every leader has to have? Most people will jump to traits and say integrity, communication, passion, knowledge. Well, the real answer to that question is what every leader has to have in order to lead are followers. Because if you don't have people following, you're not leading. And so if you really want to know the essence of leadership, especially at a young age, when you guys are just kind of starting out on your journey, is to understand what truly makes somebody want to follow somebody. And so when I think about that, I think about, well, to be a great leader, I need to know what are our followers thinking? What are, our, what are my followers believing? What are the people in our department wanting? You know, what do they really think? Because when you understand them and when you care about them and you show empathy and passion and, and direction to them, they will do great things. And when your followers do great things, the leader tends to blossom. And if you find me a really terrible leader, I'll probably find you a room full of terrible followers. And so when I think about that, I think about this. Every one of us is a follower. Even though I'm a leader, I report to Wendy, Win Wendy Winterstein. She reports to the Board of Regents. So, you know, as a leader, I'm also a follower. I need to always be a good follower for Dr. Winterstein. And so why I share that with you as interns I'd challenge each and every one of you in your internship this summer to think about how you can be the absolute best follower for whoever you're reporting to. How can you make the person you're working for be a better leader? And if you can do that, I guarantee you, you'll come out of your internship with a great reference from whoever is leading you. And so think about that. Because all of us, Dan's done it, I do it, I've done it all my career, is, you know, we all sit around and kib it sometimes on Friday night at happy hour, and we can solve all the problems in the world because we know what all the people we're following are doing wrong, right? And so I think about that often when I grouse about the organization I'm in internally and go, why did they do this, or why are we doing that, or why did the Board of Regents decide that? And I stop and think about the people in my department. And do they think that about me as the leader? And what am I not thinking about when I'm making decisions so that I'm making sure the decisions we're making in this department are in the best interest of what our followers really want? And if I do that and listen to them and give them their, their time to have input into this, then I guarantee you we're going to have a really, really good culture. And then the last piece of all this is being able to communicate. And you're gonna find in your internships, you know, you're all at different organizations, you're all gonna work for different leaders, and everybody's gonna have their own communication style. And quite frankly, some are better at it than others. Some are a lot better at it than others. And what I'd challenge you in your internships this summer is to think about the qualities of the really good leaders and on the ones that aren't so good. And what can you take away from that this summer to make yourself better as you go forward? And I'm telling you, communication, 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 and it's never been more evident during COVID-19. Because in COVID-19, we were forced to be so much more deliberate, so much more intentional, about how we communicate with our staffs because they're in vacuums. They don't have access to information. And those organizations that have been able to communicate better during this time are going to be the ones that come out of it in a much better position and much sooner when we do get to ultimately re-engage. Um, because there are certain leaders that have been very diligent and very intentional, very deliberate about their communication 
and keeping people in the loop on what's going on. And this has actually been a great, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad things that have come out of COVID-19, but there's been a lot of great things that have come out of this last two months um, that we've learned about our organization and we've learned where we've had weaknesses, but we've also learned where we've had great strengths. And so much of it has been tied to our culture, our communication, and our leadership. And then my last point to kind of tie this all back together, and then we're gonna go out to questions, is um, a statement that I usually like to uh, begin our, all of our um, department-wide meetings with as a reminder. And it's a real easy thing to say, it's a really hard thing to do. And that is this. Ultimately, when you um, achieve whatever you set out to accomplish, Remember who you were, because that's who you still are. And I'm gonna repeat that, because I think it's a really important thing to keep yourself founded on. Um, when you ultimately achieve what you set out to accomplish, remember who you were, because that's who you still are. And why that's important to say is, so many times as people find success, they let it go to their head and they start to change. They start to deviate from who they really are. And then they wonder why they don't continue to have success. Now that doesn't need to be confused with, you know, you have to be able to adapt and you, you have to be able to continually, you know, modify things along the way. But at your core, your sense of values, those things that define who you really are as a person, you can't ever leave those behind. And sometimes, especially in the profession I'm in, where you get public praise for doing things, you can let yourself, you start to believe the press clippings and you start to think you can do no wrong. And I think it's really important to stay grounded in your values of who you really are. Because again, those organizations that do that really, really well are the organizations that tend to thrive during adverse times and again, COVID-19 has been a prime example of that. Uh, I think our athletic department has stayed really grounded to who we are, and it's allowed us to navigate some challenging times in a way that have kept us together as an organization, but focused on the long-term goal of what we wanted to accomplish. So I'm gonna stop at that because we're at 30 minutes. And hopefully there's some questions out there. And I don't know, Dan, how we're going to go to the questions. If I just click on this or will you read them to me? Yeah, I'll read them to you, Jamie. But I'm going to, I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, and we had a question that had been provided about how the pandemic uh, forced you to evolve as a leader. But what I heard from you was you, what you really found in this, throughout this pandemic is that your culture is highly intact. And it's, 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 been, it's, been, it's certainly been working. And communication is important, but as you look at coming out of the backside of the pandemic, how will it change your organization? And frankly, how have you been so reassuring with the impact this is certainly going to have or could have or will have on the athletic department? Well, Dan, I think that's a great question. And, you know, I, I think of some of the discussions I've had with my peer athletic directors around the country where um, maybe they went out and hired who they thought the best coach was but they didn't get the right coach. And so that best coach has been hell on wheels during COVID-19 and focused on all the things that you would say you probably shouldn't be focused on right now. And so when I think in our organization, what I, when I talked about what I saw our strengths were, our strengths of the culture of the people that we hired were really focused on what I believe they needed to be focused on, which was the health and safety and well-being of our student athletes, our coaches, our staff, our families, um, to be very deliberate and intentional about staying connected with our fans and our constituents, to be thinking about the pain and suffering that some of our constituents are having, so that when we're making some decisions like we just did today, where we put out that, you know, you can renew your season tickets right now, and if you get close to September and you don't feel comfortable coming, we'll give you your money back. Or if you just already are there today and feel like, you know what, I just don't wanna, I can't do it, Mr. Pollard, because I'm, you know, 
I've, I've got some preconditioned health conditions or, or my finances have been dinged. And we've said, that's okay, Dan. We're going to keep your, we're going to reserve your tickets for 2021 for you. So even though you can't buy them this year, you're going to get them next year. I've had some of my peers say, gosh, you're nuts. You know, why aren't you doing that? Go for all the money. And what we've said is, no, we know our constituents. And our constituents are looking for that answer that I just gave. And because I think we had the right culture, we stayed, we stayed grounded and we stayed listening to our fans and to our community. And I think that that's been um, reassuring. So when we come out of this, I feel more comfortable about who we are because I feel like we've been rewarded. Mm -hmm. Well, and on the back side, there aren't any surprises. Your, con your constituents are not going to be surprised because you've been in communication with them all along. I like that. Here's a question from one of our, uh, our participants today. Jamie, how often are you confronted with criticism regarding decision making and how do you respond? Uh, so, um, Dan, you can answer that one too. You know, in leadership, it, it, it goes like this, folks, okay, especially in public leadership, okay? If 100% of the people agree with any decision I have to make, then I didn't make a decision, okay? You know, I always say um, when something lands on my desk, it probably needs to be 51% of the people think this and 49% of the people think that. And I hope I choose the 51%. Um, if it's a slam dunk, then I always tell my staff, somebody else didn't do their job because somebody else should have made that decision in our organization because they're empowered to make those decisions. The ones that land on my desk should be the ones that you go, oh gosh, I got to flip a coin, okay? And when you have to make those type of decisions, they're going to come with criticism. They just are. And again, if you're comfortable in your culture, if you're comfortable in your decision-making process, then you know you can put your head on your pillow at night and know you made the best possible decision for your organization, even if 50% of the people didn't agree with you, okay? Um, now, you know, I'd be lying if I'd say that I've mastered how to deal with criticism, because I haven't. And um, I always say, if you cut me, I'll bleed. If you insult me, I'll hurt. If you punch me, I'll hurt, okay? And I get cut, insulted, and punched all the time. And... You know, there are people out there in public leadership that'll say, well, I don't, you know, uh, I don't go on the chat rooms. I don't listen to Twitter. I don't listen to talk radio. And I always say, well, then you're really not human, okay? Because I'm in athletics. And so there's talk radio. And I, I'm just like every other sports fan. I like listening to that stuff. Now, are there days I want to reach into the radio and wring somebody's neck? Just about every day, okay? Because, you know, most of those people are just, you know, that's their entertainment. It's my livelihood, you know? And so it can get really insulting. It can get really impersonal. It can get really hurtful. Um, I think I've learned over time with age to try to just let some of it roll off my back. But there are days, there are days that get your dander up and, you know, I'll send an email that I'll wish I didn't. Um, when I was younger, I wanted to fight every email. You know, if somebody sent me something, you wanted to fight back and come back with a response. And I've probably learned to soften a little bit because a lot of times, a lot of the critics, if you don't respond to them, you actually win because then they don't know if you got it. If you respond to them, they could care less what you said. They just want to tell everybody, I emailed Dan Culhanian, you know, he responded back to me, right? So they know they got under your skin. So... Sometimes I feel like by not responding, I'm kind of like winning. But the critics, it's tough. But that's but public you, leadership. And you pick your spots, Jamie. I, I use a term a lot. Uh, I don't fight every battle and die on every hill. It yep. seems like you pick your spots carefully. Well, I think that that's, you know, and you'd probably say the same thing, Dan, is that just comes with time is wisdom, right? Yeah. And, you know, um, and this, it's a really good message to, you know, all of you as interns. Um, I'm sure there's some very talented people on this call.
that'll be unbelievably successful in their careers as leaders. But who you are today and what you think you know today will drastically change by the time you're Dan's and my age and you've been doing it for 30 years because you just get wisdom. And a lot of times you get wisdom from the mistakes you make. Exactly. Uh, Jamie, next question is from Ahmed. He asks, what is your biggest failure and how did you grow and or learn through that experience, whether it's here at Iowa State or prior in your career? Well, um, I may kind of modify that a little bit to say I think the biggest um, failures that I've probably come f- work m- or learned from is personnel decisions are the absolute hardest. And, um, and what makes the personnel decisions really hard is if you care and have empathy. And I feel like I have care and empathy. And, um, and so sometimes some of those personnel decisions get really gut-wrenching. And sometimes you get it right, sometimes you don't. And I think you learn over time um, about how best to navigate those. And, um, you know, when it's right to have empathy and when it's right to have compassion and sometimes when it's right to not have it. Um, But, you know, probably some of my biggest failures have just been some of those personnel decisions where, you know, you learn over time and you, you hopefully don't make the second, the same mistake twice. Can you talk a little bit about the criticism that comes along with the job and, you know, how, how do you handle the pressure that uh, either you put on yourself or that comes from external forces because of the role you're in? I mean, what's, what's your release? Well, I'd first of all say as much as there is pressure and there is, they'll never, no one will ever put any more pressure on them on me than I put on myself. And part of that goes back to is the way I'm wired. And, you know, uh, one of the things, whether you do it in part of your internship I'd ask each of you to, um, if you haven't ever done it, is to do strength finders and um, to do the exercise from strength finders to help identify what your strengths are. Because that was one of the best things I've ever done is to understand why I'm wired the way I am and why I do things the way I do. And that's helped me then learn to decompress and be able to know when I need to get away from things. Um, my number one strength, and I probably grades out as my number one, number two, and number three is I'm an activator. And so activator is a great trait to have, especially if you're strategic, because you can think about things and then you put things in motion. The problem with activators are we tend to jump, you know, without a parachute. And, um, and so what I've learned to try to do is I know when things really get happen in my life and I got a lot of things bubbling and a lot of things on my plate. Sometimes I just got to walk away and kind of deactivate the activator just long enough for myself to be able to come up for air and to think through things to start to prioritize because the activator, I mean, you could put five things on my desk today and I'll activate them all. But if you put 25 things on my desk, I feel like I got to activate all 25 before I can leave. And that's unhealthy. And um, I learned the hard way by having my heart attack that you can't do it all at once and you got to start to prioritize. And um, that's hard for an activator because an activator wants every single thing to be a priority. Um, And so I've learned to be able to walk away and do some other things, whether it's going running or um, I, I love the water. I grew up on the water. And so going to the lake is a huge, huge decompressor activator for me. Good. You know, this next question makes me, makes me think of, of mentors, but uh, the question is, who or what has taught you some of your biggest life lessons in your career and or your life? Well, um, I've got three that I, ADs that I worked for that I took something from each one of them, and I'll just real quickly summarize those. The first athletics director I worked for was a woman named Debbie Yao. She was the athletics director at St. Louis, Maryland, and North Carolina State. I worked with her at St. Louis and Maryland. She was a former uh, Division I basketball coach who had taken teams to the top 25, and she administered like a coach. And um, what I learned from Debbie was just the work ethic of a coach is just so intense that you just never can be outworked. You know, you may get out, somebody may be smarter than you, somebody may be more resourced than you, but don't let anybody ever outwork you. 
because you'll regret it. Because that's one thing you can control is your effort. And you got to give 100%. Um, don't be outworked. Um, the second athletics director that I worked for was Pat Richter at Wisconsin. Pat was um, Wisconsin's version of Fred Hoiberg, the local kid that could do no wrong. Um, you know, that just anything he touched turned to gold. And he actually, you know, um, probably isn't a great example of an athletics director because, you know, he got a free pass on a lot of stuff that most of us wouldn't get a free pass on. But what I learned from Pat is he was probably the most regal, family-oriented person I'd ever been around from a leadership standpoint. And what it really helped me understand is the value of keeping family in your organization. And so one of the things that's a great pride of at Iowa State and the culture in our athletics department is family and making sure that families are a part of our success. And, you know, you know Matt Campbell's great, but he's only great if Erica's wife and their kids are happy. And every one of us that has family associated with us needs a happy family to be a great employee. And that's what I took from Pat Richter is make sure you're paying attention to the family portion of the employee. And then the third AD I worked for was Barry uh, Alvarez, legendary football coach. And what he helped me really understand is how does a coach think? How does a division one football coach think? And it's really helped me as an athletics director interact with our coaches because I'm always thinking about what I think they're thinking about. And, you know, just because I think one way as the administrator, I got to stop and think, how's the coach thinking about this? Because they probably have a whole different lens to any particular situation. And being able to put myself in their shoes is really important. I love it. A uh, question about uh, encouraging growth in your team as a leader, and then how do you motivate your people? Well, um, growth, you know, um, a couple of things is, you know, I, I'm very involved myself in national organizations. And so I really, um, you know, I encourage our people to get involved, but not at the expense of our organization, you know, because I've, I've been around people that spend all their time in the national organization and forget that who's writing the paycheck. Mm -hmm. So remember who's on your paycheck first. But then once you've taken care of that, I think it's important to give back on a national level, but you also get back when you give back. And the get back part is part of the growth. But I also think a big part of the growth is, um, again, that family culture is I need them. The most successful people are the people that are successful in every aspects of their life. And so, you know, if they're going to be a great coach, then they need to be a great father or a great mother and or a great brother or a great sister. Um, and so helping people grow in all facets of their life is really important. And one way to make sure you do that as the leader is to make sure you grow that part of their life because we're really good at talking about what you do in the office, but what are you doing outside of the office? And, and that's been a big part of, of the growth part for me. And what was the second part of the question, Dan? Just motivating your people. Oh, and motivate. You know, the other part of motivating, um, you know, is I, I think you got to empower people. And one of the things I talk about, and that's where it goes back to, you should really ask the followers, not the leader. Um, but I think if you were to ask any of my direct reports, they'd tell you that I've been really consistent on this point, is I want you to make decisions. Don't defer to me to make every decision, because if you're going to defer to me, to make the decision, then why do I need you? You know, I need you to be on the front line making the decision. But one of the things I've always said is you could make the absolute opposite decision I'd make. And it may have been a decision that was a total failure. But I know if you made it because you thought you had done all your research, you had all your facts, you just made the incorrect decision, I'm going to support you. And I think that they would tell you that I've done that. And if you do that, to me, that's the motivation that gets people to go make their next decision. If you make, if you strap their hands and they're paralyzed, they won't be motivated to make decisions. And part of that is you got to also hold them accountable. You got to give them responsibility, but you got to hold them accountable. And there's nothing worse. And maybe you've done this, Dan, where you work for somebody that doesn't give you an answer on something. And if you don't get an answer on something, it's, it's, 
it's the most frustrating thing you can ever get because it kills your motivation. Because then it's kind of like, well, what, why am I spending my time? Why am I worried about it? Because they don't care. And so you got to make decisions and you got to, you know, you got to give people feedback, good or bad. We got time for two more questions and I'm going to, I'm going to rattle these off. We'll, we'll start with the first one. Uh, how, how do you really feel like you get honest feedback from your people? How do you, how do you extrapolate that from the folks that are closest to you inside your organization in terms of providing feedback on, on, their, um, on their performance? Well, I think one of the greatest ways you get your own personal feedback is it's, you know, you got to get out of your office and you got to be around communicating with people. Body language is the quickest way to get feedback, <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, I learned this from Debbie Yao is spouses is even a better way to get feedback because the employee can fake it because they're paid. They'll fake it. The spouse has a hard time faking it. So if the spouse doesn't like you, the employee probably doesn't like you either. Okay. And even though they may fake it around the office, but I, but I think a big part of that is body language because people have a hard time faking body language. And so you can get feedback about what people are thinking um, by just watching body language around your, your employees. Um, you know, and then giving feedback, I think that's important. You know, you, you evaluations need to be more than just, uh, you know, a feel good story. Um, I think you need to give solid critique because people want to grow. And, um, you know, they maybe don't say they want critique, but in the end, that's what they really want. You know, and so we have a saying is tell me what I need to know, not what I want to hear. Those are good words to live by. Final question, Jamie, and I like this one a lot. You know, uh, most of our folks right now are, are uh, tr trying to find themselves in, 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 for, in future roles of leadership when they're, they're not currently in leadership positions. So how do they assess and de how do they develop and assess their own leadership uh, story, if you will, uh, while working in non-leadership positions? Well, um, you know, you're, even when you think you're in a non-leadership position, people are watching you, so you are leading. And, you know, uh, um, I, I was asked this question this year when I was talking to a high school class. And one of the sophomores asked me that. And I said, well, you know, because they were looking at the leaders as seniors. And they didn't, and, I, and there was freshmen and sophomores in the class. And I said, well, the seventh and eighth graders are watching you too. And your little brother and sister is watching you too. So part of it is you're always in an, a leadership opportunity. Even when you don't think you're leading, somebody's watching you. It may be the intern that started two weeks after you that's looking to you as the senior leader of the interns. So there's always an opportunity to lead. But number two is um, I really, you know, eyes wide open, ears wide open, Take the good and bad from everything you get to experience in your intern internship this summer. Take good notes. Try to reflect upon it. Ask a lot of questions, okay? The best way to learn is to listen, but a good way to listen is to ask questions and um, to get people talking to you. You know, the fact that you're part of this summer internship program and on this call today is a great start, but do more of that. Okay. Do more of that so that you can build up who you are because it's not going to just happen overnight. It's going to be an evolution that's going to take time. And you're, you're, this is kind of a, the first great opportunity to be part of that. But what Dan and his organization is providing um, in this community for you is a wonderful opportunity to, um, to start to develop what that is. Excellent. Yeah, Jamie, I, I, I like what you just said there because I, I was an intern 28 years ago somewhere and I still have a relationship with the people that I worked with back then and just took the course of a summer. And what I've found is, is developing those leaders, those, those, uh, those uh, relationships and keeping those, keeping those and maintaining those over time is, has been critically evalu valuable for me. And I, I know it has been for you given how you passionately you talked about some of the folks that you've considered mentors in your, in your professional life. 
Well, and, and, you know, the other thing I'd tell you as an intern too is, you know, don't always think, um, you know, so often people always want to talk to somebody that they think can help them. Okay. There may be some people in the organization that you don't think can help you that may someday really be able to help you, you know, because everybody wants to come meet with the athletics director, but there's a whole set of people in my organization that people should be meeting with that may be able to really help them. Just they maybe don't see that today, but that person may not always be in that role. And so, you know, don't underestimate who may be able to help you and help you grow. Well said. Well, Jamie, if, we, if you were standing in front of this crowd of people, they'd give you a large round of applause because this is exactly what we were looking for today. I want to thank you so very much for taking some time out of a, a very busy schedule, and I'm glad you weren't in Dallas or someplace else. You might have been given okay. uh, given uh, the, the world we're living in right now, and you could, you could spend some time with us today. So thank you very much for doing it. Um, again, I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, the list is long and certainly distinguished that underwrites this programming. And I want to thank all of you as, as participants in the program today. I want you back. I want you to come back to the next one. You know, we have a kind of a, a joke around the office here that we want to catch all of you before you hit Interstate 35 upon graduation. And we want to look at you and say, if you want to stay, there are meaningful employment opportunities here in Ames and Story County and really all of Central Iowa to keep you here in Iowa after graduation. So if you want to stay, I can almost assure you we can find you a unique and meaningful opportunity to kick you off in, in, in the right fashion. There are three more sessions I really hope We'll see all of you in the next three sessions. Uh, the next one is uh, Professional Etiquette in a Virtual World. Kelsey Motley from Cyclone Sports Properties will be our, our speaker that day. That's June 11th at 3.30. We hope to see you all there. And with that, I'll say once again, thank you, Jamie Pollard, and thanks to all of you. Have a terrific afternoon. Thank you. Go Cyclones. Go Cyclones, exactly.